Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think I've, I, I used to mention this with Dornbrook and, you know, you know, uh, everyone would say, oh, we'll never find another place like that, you know, and then he confessed that his new company is like Infocom. <laughs> but yeah, everyone I talked to was like, yeah, oh, there'll never be another one of those. Um, <laughs> I could, well, I think what I talk about. Well, you'll have to ask Moretzky about that. No, no, no. Uh, I mean, I don't remember any specifics, but certainly, I mean, I mean, everybody, you know, when you look at uh, the matches in, uh, of course, now I can't remember the name of the game. <laughs> Is it Suspect, though? Is it Suspect? Well, like the pills and Suspect and uh, those things. I mean, you know, the detail was in there. I mean, that's what really made the games and, you know, and somewhat added to the quality of them. When we went to that sort of one-size-fits-all packaging, I mean, I think we definitely lost something, but we had to play the game to get in the stores. I mean, people were not going to take a box, like, suspended and put it on the shelf and, you know, not, you know, and only be able to put one on there where they could put in, you know, 12 Mario Brothers or something. So, I mean, in a way, I don't know if, you know, we should have been true to ourselves and just kept on packaging the games the way we wanted but perhaps they never would have made it onto the shelf had we done that. So I don't know. Also, as far as, you know, treating it like we were in the book business, I mean, I'm not sure certainly everyone was comfortable with that. I mean, it seemed to make sense that we were in the book business and we should be going in these different genres. But I think there was certainly some of us who thought, no, we're in the game business. I mean, you know, I don't, I, I didn't think of it so much as literature as we're selling games here. This is, you know, they can go read books, but they're doing this for something different. And uh, I don't know. I'm sure not everyone felt that way, but I really saw it more as, you know, this is about puzzles. So um, I take it parties. Let's have these events. Oh, absolutely. Things. Yes. I mean, it did take on a life of its own. I'm not really sure how it started, but like when um, Activision bought the company, we had a wedding. And so we, you know, mapped out the whole thing, printed up invitations, you know, so we were always doing stuff like that. We did uh, do anything. I think they, I mean, I'm not sure how other guys did it, but I would just kind of find myself going room to room, uh, you know. Uh, you know, honestly, I couldn't tell you where one, even one puzzle came from, I, you know. So. You're sitting there, you're writing, and next thing you know. So for you, I mean, was it a case of story came first or? Uh, no, I mean, I really, I mean, if anything, Brian Moriarty was more into, you know, B-movies and things like that. I mean, when I would mention, like, I think I, somewhere in Hollywood Hijinks, it mentions, you know, Roger Corman and one or two. B movies, but I was certainly no real aficionado. I mean, a lot of people said that uh, Hollywood hijinks was somewhat like Zork, and in that it was, you know, in a house and it had all these puzzles. It was. I mean, I didn't think of it like how can I thinly disguise this, but it really did work the same way. In that, by using these movie props, I could kind of make up things that didn't have to, you know, necessarily work a, a certain way they could you know do whatever i needed them to do because they were movie props so you know it kind of gave me the same license when we would talk about writing games and you'd say oh gee a mystery you know you're in the real world and you have to account for everything whereas you know some of these other genres just happens because that's what happens in this land or whatever so mm -hmm. even though this was you know supposedly taking place in the real world you know you're in the haunted mansion filled with b-movie props and they can do anything so it kind of freed me to create puzzles you know just about any type so uh, John Pallas mentioned something where one of the playtest parts of the company well I mean there was always uh, friction I would say between the implementers and the marketeers as we referred to them um, I mean I remember getting like the first version of the uh, the booklet that was going to go with the game and I and it was supposed to be like a tabloid mm -hmm. and I read it and I was like oh my god you know I just felt like you know that this stuff should be more you know game related or something like that 
So, you know, I ended up rewriting a lot of it, but who's to say mine was better than theirs? I mean, so, you know, some of my stuff got in, some of theirs. But, uh, I mean, I... I don't know. I mean, it was different with different implementers. I mean, I think they had a vision of everything. I mean, I'm sure Steve, you know, would uh, ideally wanted to do everything from the every feely to every, you know, word in the, the manual. Um, you know, I was, eh, I mean, a tabloid magazine was certainly the right idea, you know. Was this just a kid or anything like that? Uh, in the last... 22 years, I've gotten one email, so. Was it a good email? Uh, he wanted me, he sent me a, a copy of Hollywood Hijinks and wanted me to sign it. But that's it. <laughs> um. Um, you know, I think in the end, the majority of us were probably happy we got bought because, you know, you know, there was a chance there to keep making more games, different games. We were now with these guys who, you know, did graphics, which we weren't really doing at the time, so. Um, sure. Um, and, and in retrospect, I mean, not that you could have foreseen what Microsoft would do, but clearly nothing was going to withstand the onslaught of whatever Microsoft wanted to do. Now, whether they would buy Cornerstone and take it in the desert and bury it, or, you know, adapt it as their own or something, had that things gone that way, but... I don't think anything would have stopped Microsoft. Right. The Excel spreadsheets would have had a uh, CNR extension. Yeah. Speak a little bit to Mark Blank about Cornerstone because he was talking. Did he tell you? So this was years later. He and I are working together in Oregon in, I want to say 1989, about, or maybe a little later. Eh, maybe 89, 90. And he uh, goes to the dentist one day, and he's sitting in the office. He looks up on the shelf, and there is a big blue box. His dentist used Cornerstone. And love the product. Well, the, Mark's attitude on it, if I recall this correctly from the interview, was basically the... Uh, I haven't talked... Believe it or not, I have actually not talked very much to implementers about Cornerstone. Mostly because everything I've read up uh, indicates that it was kept so separate from everybody that it was well, just... not as the butt of every joke in the implementer suite. Certainly, it was popular there, but it was a case, it wasn't a case of you know you were trying it out or anything, and so oh, uh, we tested it when when I was a tester, <laughs> when, I, when I was in charge of testing, Cornerstone was being tested by the same group. I mean, we had business people, but game testers tested Cornerstone also. Did you have any impressions on the product at the time? The puzzles were way too hard. The um that situation well at the time Hollywood hijinks came out things were starting to uh, you know starting to go downhill for the company uh, cornerstone I think had been out a while with the business product and it wasn't a huge success so you know Hollywood hijinks was kind of uh, one of the last games that maybe had the you know some marketing behind it uh, you know we kind of ran out of Ran out of gas so somewhat after that. I mean, there were still, you know, games came out and they got publicized, but. Uh, the, uh, and. Oh, in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, we had a party at Liberace's house. And then uh, they had rented a mansion where they had uh, the kickoff for, uh, I believe it was Suspect. With the uh, letter, you know. Well, one of the things we did when uh, Hollywood Hijinks came out, which was. Uh, I think it was the first time we did it. It was called uh, Marathon of the Minds. And we went, ar went around to various science museums throughout the country. And they would grab uh, kids from various high schools. And they would all play overnight in a science museum competing on uh, to play Hollywood hijinks. And so that was kind of, you know, sort of a publicity thing. And yet it was kind of, you know, here we get kids who maybe, you know, they're not on the basketball team or the football team, but they still get to be in this competition. And, uh, yeah, we traveled around. We Pittsburgh, uh, out in Los Angeles, San Diego, uh, quite a few different places, yeah. I didn't know Moretzky didn't like Vegas. I got the impression from him he just doesn't 
Like really? going to oh. Vegas. I remember him. Uh, one of the first ones we went to was uh, Chicago. And it was, you know, the company was young. And we I think we took like more than half the company to this... Uh, I don't know if it was probably was CES. I don't know if it had moved to Vegas permanently by then, but it was a big, big convention there in uh, Chicago. He was definitely at that one. Right. I think there was one that he mentioned or what else that you give or anything like that. Um, well, I think there was kind of two directions there, like say with uh, uh, Plundered Hearts or the uh, Sea Stalker, where we were trying to go down sort of familiar, you know, literary paths. You know, the Hardy Boys, romance novels, thinking that, you know, the interactive fiction was the same market as books. All we had to do was just be in the different genres there and what, how could it fail? On the other hand, you take something like, you know, Mind Forever Voyaging, which was, you know, you know, I don't know, very heavy science fiction, which even say in, as a science fiction book might have not appealed to a broad range of people. So... You know, it was it was an unusual game. I mean, in some respects, it, it was all so new that I think it was kind of, you know, who knew what was going to work at that point? I mean, the standard puzzle game certainly worked, but I think once you, you know, wrote a few of those, you didn't want to keep writing, you know, the same puzzle games over, We, you know. So I got the impression, and... Things like that. One day we were talking about the properties of back guano, and in the middle of it we stopped and said, no one's going to believe we actually discussed this at work. You know, what you could do with it, what happened to it, stuff like that. Um, I'd be able to do it for you? Um, I remember one time talking to Steve about I wanted to use a rope in a puzzle, and he said, don't do it, don't do it. I tried it. He had tried it in Planet Fall. And then, you know, you, you get into these discussions and what seems simple is not when it comes to interactive fiction because you've got a rope that can be tied to anything. There's two ends of it. Can one end be in one room and one be in the other? So, you know, it didn't take long for him to talk me out of a rope. <laughs> and that's one thing, that's one theme which I find in these, the coding environment. Well, I would say unlike most of the implementers who actually learned, I mainly just ran around the office groveling most of the time. Uh, I mean, I could write the basics, but when it got to something complicated, I was generally on Muretsky or Leveling's doorstep. It's usually the way it worked. Was there uh, entity at a meeting or? No, actually, the, the idea for Hollywood hijinks came from a tester to Liz Jones. It was her idea to, you know, come up with a haunted house type scenario where you stayed overnight. You know, I think it's from some, I think, you know, one or two movies had the same kind of premise. And then it just took off from there with, uh, you know, creating this character, you know, Uncle Buddy and, you know, his whole life in B movies and things. So the game? Um, well, I think among game testers, you're always thinking that, you know, you could write a game or you'd like to start one. So there was always ideas kicking around for, for uh, different types of games. Um, uh, Tom Bach, who was a summer tester when he was 16, his father was, at the time, the president of Harvard, and he came to work for us. And uh, one summer we took Zork and rewrote some of the text from that as sort of an experiment to see you know, what we could get it to do. And at first, we weren't even changing the code. We were just rewriting text just to see, you know, what would happen. And uh, he ended up taking that and turning it into a game that unofficially circulated around. It was called Zock for uh, Zork and Bach combined there. So uh, that was what kind of got some of us going. He and I and uh, Jeff O'Neill worked on that. So um, in testing... Uh, at one point, we were pretty large. When we moved to the new building, there might have been eight or nine people. Mm -hmm. And then uh, with every game towards the end, we would do two rounds of outside testing where we would mail it to, I don't know, 15 or 20 people outside just to get another, you know, bunch of eyes on it. Now, how were they chosen? Uh, people who had written to us mainly. 
you know, if they read something in the New York Times or had sent in a good letter, and, you know, and you could tell they were into the games. I mean, there were some people who did some very exhaustive testing and, you know, were very, it's off of my head, but I mean, obviously the stories were pretty much done. We weren't going to say, hey, this doesn't even make sense. It was more smaller, you know, smaller things or like logic things that we thought maybe didn't make sense or, you know, no one's going to get this puzzle because it's just too hard. You know, there's not enough. And they would, you know, maybe go back and change it. But basically you kind of, a lot of times it would be a consensus, you know, did you think it was too hard? Did enough people think it was, you know, just right? That type of thing. But uh, as far as, you know, I mean, the implementers were different. I mean, some of them are much more likely to take your suggestions, whereas others were, eh. like Mark Blank was famous for, on the bug sheets, you would write down what the problem was, and then there was a small section where it would say resolution, and Mark would always, not always, but often write in knit, as if you're just nitpicking on that one, you know. And I mean, some of these books, I think Steve Moretzky still has, you know, thick, thick binders of all the bug reports. So, I mean, some of these games, you know, they were thousands of bugs. So I'm sure at some point you got a little fed up. The, uh, well, the one, you know, for most people, the uh, becoming an implementer. Well, for the first six months that I was there, I was a tester. And they didn't really have anyone. They only had two or three game testers at the time. As the company was just starting for the most part. I mean, they had a fair number of people. And then uh, after six months, they uh, picked me to be uh, the manager of testing. And so then it kind of went from there. And I don't remember how many years, but it was at least three or four years before I moved on from that. So we went through, you know, a lot, tested a lot of games in the meantime. Was there a case in testing? Gonna lead to. But, uh, and having played their games, I figured this is probably gonna be fun, so. Um, so, um, what are you basically up to? You grab your stack of bug sheets and you start playing the game. And you're looking for everything from misspellings to, you know, bugs. You try everything twice and, you know, you get the response of you pick something up and it says you're now holding the gun and then you say pick up the gun and it says you're now holding the gun. So obviously something's wrong there. Uh, on to other things like logic or something the map didn't make sense. And then also, you know, is it too hard? Is it too easy? All those things. Um, so surprisingly, it was just answering an ad in the Boston Globe. I was working uh, in a lumber mill and I had moved here about three, four months previously from Los Angeles with a buddy of mine, Jeff O'Neill, who also ended up working at Infocom. And I saw an ad in the paper for Game Tester for Infocom and I had played their games before. So I applied for the job and a few weeks later I was out of the lumber mill and testing games. Now, when you first walked in with the, the game testing, do you remember